Well, good morning, church, and good morning to all of you watching online. We're so happy you've joined us this Sunday morning. We're in this series, New Normal, and if there's one thing I don't want to be, it's normal. I don't want to be a normal husband. I don't want to be a normal father. I don't want to be a normal pastor. I don't want to be a normal anything. Now, you can be normal if you want to be normal. You can be average. You can be regular. You can be ordinary if you want to be those things, but I don't want to be, I want to stay far away from normal as possible. Now with that said, as much as I don't want to be normal, just so you know, I also don't want to be weird, okay? I don't want to be strange, I don't want to be odd, I don't want to be peculiar. However, I think I would rather be weird, or at least considered to be weird, than to be like everybody else. And the reason I don't want to be normal is because normal isn't working. Normal isn't working in our marriages, Normal isn't working in our parenting. Normal isn't working in our finances. Normal isn't working in our relationship with God. Normal isn't working anywhere. Think about this with me for a second. It, it, is, it is normal in our culture today for young adults to, to hop, and even older adults to hop around from bed to bed with no strings attached until they finally meet someone they feel they can spend the rest of their lives with. Then, for some reason, if the marriage doesn't work out, and why would it, honestly, it's normal for that husband or that wife to divorce each other and to start all over again. It's also normal in our culture today to buy things you can't afford with money you don't actually have to impress people you don't really like. Uh, I could go on and on, but honestly, I, I don't think I, I have to. I think you already know that normal isn't working, don't you? But the good news is this morning is that almost 2,000 years ago now, Jesus showed up and introduce to anyone who would listen a new and better way of living, a new normal. More specifically, right at the beginning of his ministry, and you can see this in Matthew's account specifically of Jesus' life, Jesus says these words to usher in his new way of doing things, this new normal. Jesus began to preach, and this is his invitation right from the beginning. Notice this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, because all of us probably have our own ideas of what it means to repent, I want to make sure you understand exactly what this word means, because this is a word that so many of us just get wrong. We misunderstand this word. So let me give some clarity as to what it means when Jesus calls us, all of us, to repent. The word repentance really means a true change of one's mind that leads to a true change of one's heart. Repentance is a a true change of one's mind that leads to a true uh, change in one's heart. In other words, repentance is both intellectual and emotional. It's not just intellectual, it's not just emotional, it's both. It's intellectual in that a decision, an intentional decision is made with your head. It's emotional in that this decision eventually shows up in how you live your life, how you respond to the world around you. Let me try to illustrate this if I can. My wife, Robin and I met in the fall of 1995 at Liberty University. I was a junior, she was a sophomore. I was studying with this friend of mine in the library and she came up, and it was a mutual friend that we had. We didn't know each other, and she introduced herself to me. We made a little small, small talk, and before long, we started hanging out together. Now, I wasn't looking to date anyone. I was seriously focused on my studies at this time, preparing to become a pastor. But I had this regular group of friends, a mixture of guys and girls that I, that I spent time with, and Robin kind of became a part of this, this group. Now, maybe I was a little bit conceited, but I had, and I was probably a lot conceited, but I had this notion, this sense that every girl in my group of friends liked me. Any guys like that? Some of you are like that, right? I mean, I was just conceited in that way. Not only that, but I sensed that Robin especially liked me, so I began to kind of distance myself from her somewhat. I thought I was being subtle. She thought I was being a total and complete jerk, which I probably was. Uh, Anyway, one one day Robin decided to call me out on my behavior, and honestly, I can remember this moment like it was yesterday. I was about to walk into the library. I had a Greek class coming up in an hour, and I was kind of going to prepare for an assignment that was due. But before I could even get in the doors of the library, she just comes out of nowhere, stops in front of me, and says something along the lines of, I need a word with you. And I, I respectfully said, okay. I had no idea what was in store for me, but for the next hour... Uh, Robin gave me all kinds of reasons why she didn't like me. Uh, she said things like, you think I'm so in love with you, but I'm not. You think I go home every weekend and try on wedding dresses, but I don't. You think you're God's gift to the women on this campus, but you're not. And on and on and on she went. I'm not even, I'm not even kidding. She went on for an hour straight. And I just stood there 
and took it like a man. Uh, after she finished making her arguments, which were quite compelling, honestly, I gave her a hug, said I'm sorry, but more than anything else, I changed my mind about this woman. In fact, later that afternoon, I called her for the first time ever. I began to call her every day, multiple times throughout the day. Eventually, I told her that I loved her. And then, over eight months after that conversation outside the library, I asked her dad for her hand in marriage. And, of course, ironically, she did try on some wedding dresses, and we got married. Now, here's how this relates to repentance, because I want to make sure you're with me. In the, in, in the spring of 1995, after being confronted by her right outside the library, I made a decision, a conscious decision, to change the way that I thought about Robin. I, in a word, repented. And this wasn't just something that happened in my head, although that's where it began. This wasn't just intellectual. This, was, this is something that happened in my heart as well. This had an emotional component to it. Also, a true change took place in my mind. I began to change the way I thought about Robin, the way I viewed Robin, and guess what happened? That view, that perspective spilled over into my heart, spilled over into my emotions. And this is what repentance is. It's a true change of one's mind that leads to a true change of one's heart. It's both intellectual and emotional. It's not one or the other, it's, it's both. Back to Jesus now. So Jesus shows up to the world and right away, at the outset of his ministry, he asked us to change our minds about some things. More specifically, he calls us to leave behind our normal way of thinking and viewing the world and embrace a new normal. And this morning, I want us to briefly look at one of the earliest teachings of Jesus, a teaching that takes place really right after his words on repentance, a teaching that's absolutely connected to that, uh, a teaching also found in Matthew's account of Jesus' life. And so let's just kind of jump right in. This is Jesus speaking. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago. In other words, the old normal is. You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. So Jesus says, look, you've heard that killing someone is a sin. I think all of us in the room can still agree, yes, that is absolutely a sin. But then Jesus raises the bar. He, he says that his expectations are way higher than simply avoiding murder. He says, but I tell you, in other words, the new normal is that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, some of you, you feel really good about yourselves because you've never killed anyone. You, you feel especially spiritual because you haven't knocked anyone off. But, but I think you should know that just because you've never acted on your unhealthy, angry thoughts in a physical way, just because you've never engaged in any kind of violent act, doesn't mean you're off the hook. In fact, I want you to know that if you've ever even wished someone were dead, if you've ever even cursed someone out under your breath, if you've ever even envisioned something really terrible happening to, happening to someone you do not like, and we've all done that, haven't we? Well, you're just as guilty as a murderer. He says... I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So Jesus, in this moment, makes it transparently clear that, and I, and I hope that you'll think about this with me, but he makes it transparently clear that sin, sin is not just something that shows up on the outside, and that's all that it is. Sin is, first and foremost, something that happens on the inside. Sin is not something that is primarily external. That's just one component of it. Sin is also something that is very much Internal. I think so many of us see sin this way. We see sin as something that's just external. And it's easy to, to think about it this way, obviously. But in this moment, Jesus redefines this. And he argues that, no, 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 before it's ever external, before it ever shows up, it's already been happening. It's already been stirring around in here. It's already been happening internally. It's something that happens on the inside first, not the outside. And this is why, Jesus says, we have to change our minds. We have to change the way we think about sin. We can't just categorize and say, oh, this external thing is wrong and avoid the internal problem that's leading to the external problem. Then Jesus elaborates on this particular idea a little bit. He says more about this anger that often can lead to, to murder. He says, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be danger in danger of the fire 
of hill. Now, the word raka is a term that in that day meant empty-headed, you know, kind of maybe like an airhead or something along those lines today that we might say. And that may not seem very offensive to you. In fact, you're like, that doesn't seem very offensive. But in, but in this culture where, where people literally got their identity from their name, their parents named them a particular name to, to sort of shape their identity in a lot of ways. To call someone a name, especially to call them this kind of name, was to strip them of that identity. And this was considered highly derogatory in the first century, even though it may not seem that derogatory here in the the 21st century. In fact, this was essentially the worst thing that you could call somebody. And so Jesus says, hey, don't do that. Additionally, Jesus also instructs them not to pull a Mr. T. I know Mr. T made the word fool popular, and and we, we use that from time to time. He says, look, anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, the reason... Because you're thinking, it's just language, man. It's just words. But the reason Jesus is so extreme at this moment is because he knows how dangerous our anger can be. He knows the potential for anger. He knows that murder starts in the heart before it ever shows up in the action. He knows that all of us think something before we ever do something, even if that's momentary thinking. And this is why, I think this is what Jesus is saying, if there is actual hatred in your heart, and a lot of us have it, you know, what the, you know what else is true? There's potential homicide in your heart. This is, so anger's the problem. Anger's the, the, the thing that leads to murder. And he says, hey, we've got to address that. And then Jesus, after exposing our anger issues, tells us what we need to do. He gives us sort of some recommendations to deal with it. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you because of something you've done, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So Jesus says, look, if there's an issue between you and someone else, and more specifically, if you are the cause of that issue, and we're often the cause of the issues that show up in our lives, aren't we? He says, if you're the one who initiated, if you've hurt someone else with your angry, mean-spirited words, then you need to do everything in your power to set things right, to make things right. You need to stop doing what you're doing, even if it's, if it's something religious in nature, even if you're at church, you need to get up out of your seat and go take care of that. You need to go make the phone call, set up the appointment, have the conversation, deal with it. Don't let it fester and simmer any longer. Get up and do something about it right now. Now, so Jesus is saying, look, when you find yourself, and we all find ourselves in this place, where the anger is overwhelming, you need to repent. You need to change the way you think about that other person. You, can't, you cannot, you must not let resentment and bitterness fester and grow. That's what everyone else does. That's the normal way of dealing with our anger. And by the way, it's not enough to, to just not act on your anger, to refrain from doing something in the moment. No, instead, you need to make things right with that other person. You need to go and be reconciled to them. And then after Jesus addresses anger slash murder, he brings up another issue where repentance is needed, where a new normal needs to be embraced. He says, you have heard that it was said, again, old normal, you shall not commit adultery. So Jesus brings up another one of the Ten Commandments to our attention. And as you might expect, everyone in the crowd is nodding in agreement. Yes, Jesus, we agree with you. You shall not commit adultery. You should not commit adultery. You must not commit adultery. But then Jesus makes it extremely clear that adultery, avoiding adultery is not really the issue. He says, but I tell you, new normal, that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus says to that first century crowd, he says to all of us this morning, look, so many of you feel good about yourselves because you've never physically crossed the line. You've never physically committed adultery. But you should know that if you've ever stared a little too long, if you've ever had thoughts about someone that were less than pure, if you've ever let your imagination go to places it has no business going, then you are equally guilty. You are an adulterer. In other words, Jesus argues that simply maintaining one's physical purity is not the goal. It's bigger than that. His goal is way bigger than that. He demands that we aim higher than simply avoiding a fling or avoiding some sort of emotional or physical affair. And again, his reason for this is simple. He wants us to know that sin is not just something that shows up on the outside. Sin is something that is swirling around in here, something that's festering and happening on the inside. Now, please understand, because I know what some of you are thinking, because you're thinking like me. Jesus is not saying that real 
and imaginary affairs are identical in their repercussions. We know that they're not, don't we? We know that that's not true. He's also not saying that if you've ever thought about crossing the line, you might as well cross the line because you're already guilty. That's not what he's saying. Instead, Jesus is simply saying that when you begin thinking about it, when you will let your imagination run wild, go out of bounds, when you begin entertaining lustful thoughts, it won't be long until you actually act on them. Because when you let something happen on the inside, eventually, and you don't put a stop to it, eventually it's going to make its way to the outside. That's what Jesus is saying. In fact, Jesus knows and wants us to know that when someone commits adultery, it's usually because they've been thinking about committing adultery for some time. And because they've been thinking about it, when the opportunity presents itself, when the opportunity arises, they are ready to act on it. So in this moment, Jesus simply redefines adultery for all of us. He says, look, don't merely think of adultery as this physical act. It's so much more than that. And because it is, I want you to change the way that you think about it. I want you to redefine adultery in your mind. I want you to see it the way that that I see it. I want you to repent. I want you to embrace a new normal. I want you to see the problem as something internal, not merely external. And then Jesus says the craziest thing in recommending how we might deal with this particular struggle. He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, Jesus is point, obviously, is not to literally hurt yourself, harm yourself. He's not for self-mutilation, self-harm. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, hey, you need to go ahead and schedule the eye surgery because this is a problem for you. Get them removed. That's going to take care of the problem. That's not what he's saying at all. That's not what he's recommending. Instead, what's he doing? He's exaggerating to make a point. He's using hyperbole to make a point. Jesus is simply saying, look, in order to address your internal struggle appropriately, you may have to do something extreme. In fact, he's saying whatever you have to do, even if it seems ridiculous and far-fetched, whatever you have to do to defeat the power of sin in your life, however drastic it may seem to someone else, your friends, your peer group, you know, whoever else, you need to be prepared to do that thing, whatever that thing is. If you have to get rid of the internet, get rid of the internet. If you have to get rid of your smartphone, Get rid of your smartphone, whatever it takes to lessen the power of sin in your life, you need to do that. That's what Jesus is saying. Because again, sin is not primarily an external issue, it's an internal issue. And then, finally, a little later in this same teaching, Jesus says these words, you have heard that it was said, old normal, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, But I tell you, new normal, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Jesus says, look, you've heard that if someone hits you or hurts you, you have permission to retaliate in like kind, in like measure. You've heard that that vengeance is an appropriate response. But I say that even though it may may be normal to do such a thing, to, to hit someone back, to retaliate, to get some kind of revenge, I want you to respond differently. In other words, Jesus says, I don't want your first response to be like everyone else's in your culture. I don't want you to think to yourself, I wonder how I can get them back. I wonder how, how, I, can, how I can enact some sort of revenge. I want your first response instead to be, how can I serve this person who obviously is struggling in life? How can I help this person? How can I minister to this person? How can I, and this is so countercultural, right? How can I love this person that's hurting me? Now, please understand, Jesus is not saying that we shouldn't or we can't defend ourselves. That's not what he's saying at all. Instead, he's just saying that even though your normal, natural instincts may be to tell you to take matters into your own hands, to seek some sort of revenge when someone is hurting you, you need to choose to respond in a different way. You need to embrace a new normal. In fact, he gives us a few examples of how, how, what this might look like. He says, and if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt... Hand over your coat as well. 
If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So Jesus is, is saying over and over in all these different ways throughout this teaching, I want you to change the way that you think about things like murder and adultery and getting even. Or in other words, I want you to change the way that you think about everything. I want you to repent. I want you to change your mind intellectually because that will end up changing your heart emotionally. Now there's so much more that Jesus says in this sermon. You can read Matthew 5 for yourself later on if you want to. But I want to stop right here. And I want to address the tension that you must be feeling, because I felt these as, as I read these words, but that you must be feeling as you read these words of Jesus, as you hear these words of Jesus. In fact, if you're like me, you're probably thinking to yourself, this is impossible, Matt. Like, no one can live this way. I mean, no, no one can pull this off. No one can, can, can do what Jesus is asking us to do. I mean, how am I not supposed to have angry thoughts about someone else? Not a day goes by without me having angry thoughts about someone else. I mean, how, how am I supposed to keep my mind from going to places that it inevitably seems to go to from time to time? How am I supposed to do that? Man, man how am I supposed to turn the other cheek? And I might be inclined to agree with you and say that this is impossible except for the fact that someone has already done this. Someone's already lived this way. Not only that, but this someone is the same one who asked you and I to do this too. This someone is the same one who asked us to embrace this new way of living, this new normal. And he expects us to live this way. Now with that said, you should know, and you probably already do, but this embracing of a new normal will not happen haphazardly. It will not happen accidentally or randomly. In fact, unless we intentionally choose to change our minds about sin, unless we intentionally decide to repent, we will continue to be like everyone else. Not only that, but this is, this is not even something we can do once and we're good to go. This is something that really we must do constantly throughout our day-to-day -day life. Constantly, if you're like me, you, you constantly need to repent for the way you're thinking in a moment. Constantly to reorient. God, I don't want to think that way. Change my mind so it will change my heart. We need to constantly be seeing and viewing our sin, not as something that just shows up on the outside, but it's something that is swirling around on the inside that we need to deal with and address. And if we will allow our minds to be changed, which is what Jesus asked us to do, you know what will happen? Our hearts will be changed in the process. Our hearts will follow our minds' lead. Not only that, but Jesus will actually, for those of us who truly repent of our sins and give our lives to, to God, God will give us his spirit. He will put his spirit in us, and if we will cooperate with his spirit, we can live this kind of life that seems so impossible as we hear Jesus say these words. Now with that said, I want to speak to those of you in the room, those of you online, who've never made the decision to, to repent. You, you've never made the decision to follow Jesus. If that's you, if you've never acknowledged Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, I want to invite you to change your mind about him right now. I want to invite you to change your, because maybe you think, oh, Jesus is a, a great religious moral teacher, or he's someone who said some super inspirational things. I want you to change your, the way you think about Jesus. And, and more specifically, I want to invite you to change the way you view your sin. I want you to change your mind about who Jesus is and why Jesus came if you've never realized and understood. And this can't be just an intellectual decision on your part. This has to be an emotional decision on your part. This has to affect every single part of who you are. In fact, I, I just want everybody just right now, just to bow your heads for just a minute. Because there's some of you right now, you need to pray this prayer that I'm going to lead you in. There's some of you online who need to pray this prayer that I want to lead you in. In fact, you need to know that Jesus will make all the difference in your life. And Jesus is the only way that you can live and embrace this new normal. You can't do this in your own strength. And some of you need to pray a prayer like this this morning. Just, just say this with me right there under your breath. Dear Heavenly Father, I realize this morning that normal isn't working for me. I need a new normal. And I believe with all my heart and with all my mind that Jesus is the only one who can give this to me. So right now, I'm changing the way that I think. I'm changing my mind about my sin. I'm, I'm seeing my sin as something that offends you. I'm seeing my sin as something that separates me from you. 
I'm owning it. I'm confessing it. I'm turning from it. I'm changing my mind about it. On top of that, Jesus, I'm accepting the forgiveness that you offer me through your death on the cross. Please forgive me and accept me into your family. I'm making the decision to surrender everything to you. And with your head still bowed, if you made that decision, you need to know that you just moved from death to life. You just moved from old normal to new normal. This shouldn't just be an intellectual thing that you just did and you went through the motions. If it did, if that's what you did, that's not gonna work for you. If you truly changed your mind about your sin and how you see it affecting God, that will show up in your heart. It's gonna take some time. It's a process. Growing in your relationship with God is a process, but God will absolutely begin to change you and make you. And we wanna know about that. We'd love for you to, to tell us about that. Come see me after the service. Email us at connected at southsidefamily.com. Let us know. Everyone look back up here again. Um, if you're already a follower of Jesus, and so many of you online, some of you in this room, uh, that's, that's who you are, then you need to know that repenting is not just a once and for all thing that you do and you're done. It's something that, that's constant. Because sin, again, because it's swirling around and if it's not dealt with on a daily basis, it tends to show up and... And we have to stay on top of this. We have to constantly be reframing the way we think about our sin. We have to constantly be realizing that our sin offends a holy God and, and puts some distance between us and our relationship with him. And we've got to make sure that we're calling it what it is, that we're not making excuses for it at all. We must always be choosing to repent. We must always be realizing our sin is not a, an out external problem. It's an internal problem. It's something that we have to deal with. We must learn to think differently about our sin so we will live differently. Now, with all that said, if you want to be normal, and, and maybe some of you do, maybe that's what you want. You want to embrace the old normal, you like that. Let me tell you what, need, what you need to do. You don't need to do anything, right? Let I me mean, just keep living like you're living. I mean, and, and, uh, if that's working for you and feel like that's working for you, you keep doing it. But, but that's, that's not the way Jesus invites you in. And ultimately, that way is going to fail you in so many ways, not just in this life, but in the life to come. If I were you, I would take what Jesus asked us to do to heart. I would change, if I were you, I would change the way that I, that I think. And more than anything else, I would stay as far away from normal as possible because normal just isn't working. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. God, as much as it hurts how he exposes our hearts and he points to our true issues and problems, God, help us to see the need to recognize that sin is not primarily something that's a problem outside of us. It's a problem inside of us. God, again, if there's anyone who's never dealt with their sin in a permanent way and given their lives to you and accepted the forgiveness that you offer, God, may they make that decision today. But for those of us who've, who have accepted that forgiveness and yet are not regularly continuing to change our minds about the way we view sin, God, help us to do that. Help us to take sin seriously. God, help us to repent even now in the next few minutes as we sing this song. May there be some changing of some minds that lead to some changing of some hearts. I want to invite everybody to stand.